I'm sitting here with uh, three-time pro bowler and first-time all-pro linebacker Lofa Tatupu from the Seattle Seahawks. Lofa, it's an honor for me, and I thank you very much that you take your time. We don't want to waste, uh, waste too much of it, so let's start with the first question. Um, what does the Seattle Seahawks as a franchise mean to you as a player as well as a person when you look at it now? Um, what did the franchise... Uh, to, did to you um, as a, uh, for your development and um, I mean you, you, you started a company a few years back after your professional career and you, you started a family, you lived there in the area so what does Seattle mean to you? It's, it's, it's home, you know um, I grew up on the other side the east coast in Massachusetts but And I didn't know much about Seattle, you know, in Washington when I got drafted, when my name got called, you know, I was like, oh man, that's, you know, the other corner. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, you know, I was in, you know, California at the time with school and, and I knew I was going up north, you know, almost, almost to Canada. But, um, you know, I knew very little about it and I didn't realize how much I was going to fall in love with the place and, uh, you know, not just the organization, And, and, you know, the way it was, it was ran by the great, the late, great Paul Allen, mm. who, I mean, first class, everything that this organization and this team, um, you know, and what he meant to, to, to this, you know, not just the, the team, but the whole city of Seattle and, you know, in Washington, um, the, the amount of, you know, charity work and, you know, the, the stuff that the Hawks do, you know, in the community, it's, um, I couldn't have landed at a better place and could not be more grateful to, to call Seattle home and, um, you know, just have pretty, I played my full career here. I did, I know I did sign one year with Atlanta in 2012, but I was hurt and I never played a game. So I, I can say I'm a, you know, a hawk through and through. And uh, it was, um, it was incredible to, to be great, blessed to, to play for this organization and, um, and call Seattle home. I, I didn't realize how beautiful this place was. And, and when I moved away, um, you know, for, for two years, when I was done playing football, I went back home to Massachusetts and then I came back to coach and, um, you know, we've been here ever since 2015 and going on five years and, um, it's, it's been a blessing. So you, so you fell in love with Washington state as well, as well oh. as the, the, the city of Seattle. Oh man. It's, um, you know, it's, it's different. The East coast was fast paced, you know, out here. It's, um, it's, it's more my style, a little more laid back, but it's still, it's still very, you know, business-like, uh, business-minded. A lot of great companies were, were founded out here. And uh, so, and hopefully, you know, my, my, my CBD company, Zone in CBD is the next great company. But, yeah. um, but just the people and like the 12s, you know, I don't, there, there is no better fan base. And I'm, you know, I know a lot of players say that, but it, it was, To me, because I we had I played six years here. We went to the playoffs, four of them, two, two of them we did not. And those two years, those two years really showed me more than the four years of winning. The two years when we were not good, when we, we went four and 12 and followed up five and 11, um, we still sold out every game, every home game. And they were still cheering loud as they always did. And you know, and that's you know, because anybody can be a fan when times are good. It's easy, right? But yeah. when times are hard, you know, like as in just in life, when times are hard, like who's there for you? And the 12s were always there for us. And so that's that's why I fell in love with the city, the fan base and the organization. So let's let's take it back to your early days as a player or as a person. Um, your dad, Mosey, had a, had a long NFL career, I, I guess, 12 years for the Patriots as a fullback, 14 yeah. years in total. Um, yeah. When did it became clear to you as a young kid that you wanted to follow the path of your dad? For the first time I knew what football was, man. Um, you know, I, I wanted, I was like begging my parents to play when I was five years old, but, yeah. the, but the age limit is seven. You have to be seven years old. Yeah. So, you know, and uh, I'm just- So, so it I'm starts, just, so it, it starts with PV in, in the US as well with seven yeah. years. Okay. Yep, starts at, at seven years old is when you're allowed to play. Um, and so I remember waiting and then I finally got the chance and I just fell in love with it. And, um, you know, I, I remember going to the stadium with my dad. I remember, you know, being in the locker room, the weight room. And, um, you know, I just, 
any chance I got, I would try to go to the stadium with him and, uh, and just hang out right? and um, run on the field. And, and I love football, man. I was just a football guy from that. I mean, when I was five, six years old, most kids, they were out playing, right? And, and if I, you know, if I had the chance, if football was on the TV, I was not going outside <laughs> at five years old. I was glued to the TV and just totally enamored with, it became an obs obsession. And, um, you know, that's, that's how much I love football. And so um, from sun up to sundown, if I wasn't playing football, I was watching it on TV. And, um, and it just, you know, I started to really get knowledgeable about the game, you know, and I did have my dad to lean on for some questions, but um, he always, he always wanted me to play baseball, but. Yeah. I that's football. what I wanted, wanted to ask if there ever was another sports for you as an option. I, I played everything, football, baseball, basketball, baseball was my best sport. I, I was very, very good at baseball and I yeah. had to work very, very hard to be good at football. But, and that's the thing that, You know, my dad was because he was a really good baseball player, too, and basketball player. Um, and, you know, he was telling me, he's like, I, I think you got a real chance with baseball if you stick with it. And okay. I, I told him, I was like, I just don't love it like that. I wasn't which means I wasn't willing to put in the work to get to the major to the MLB, Major League Baseball. I knew I was going to put in the work from sunup to sundown for football. And so. I, I was willing to sacrifice even at a young age. I, I, I told him, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to play football like you. So you loved him. I think that's oh. the, the main thing. Or? Oh my God. It's, it's man. I miss it. I love it. I love watching it. I love being a fan now. Like, yeah. I'm, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, th those playing days are over. I, I'm, I'm glad they happened. And now I can watch football stress-free and just, you know, enjoy, even though the Hawks, they give us, they give us plenty of stress, you know, yeah. in the fourth quarter, but that's when, you know, Russell Wilson usually likes to shine, <laughs> but hopefully <laughs> we get back to those, those years where they're just blowing people out though. Yeah. But you have, you always have to take this in relation. So, I mean, since Wilson came here, they, they've been to the playoffs eight of nine times. So um, mm -hmm. now when the criticism ca comes up, I always say, come on guys, what are we talking here about? It's, yeah. it's, the, it's, it's the most successful franchise for the last decade, I guess, together with it's the Patriots. Them in New England, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's, you got to just keep things in perspective that, you know, there's a lot of people that would, would love to go to the playoffs. And, yeah. you know, we, we, yeah. we go pretty much every year, almost every year, <laughs> knock on wood. Yeah, I know, I know some Chats uh, fans who would approve it. Yeah, absolutely. I, right? Yeah. So. But they love it still. They love their franchise. So. Um, yeah, they they're do. fans. Either you are a fan or you are not. It's it, it depends. Yeah. It, it does not depend on success, I suppose. But you know, yeah. that's the fandom. Yeah. Um, but let's get back. You played uh, at USC. You transferred to USC. You played there for two years, won yeah. two national titles, played under Pete Carroll as a head coach and Ken Norton as your defensive coordinator. Yeah. Um, the positions they respectively um, are holding until now. Um, so. What did you learn from Ken Norton playing the linebacker position? Was he was he as important as Pete Carroll to you as a young player? Yeah, uh, Ken Norton. I mean, the reason that USC had the success at the linebacker position was because because of two well three guys: Nick Holtz, our first co our coordinator and linebacker coach, and then Rocky Seto and Ken Norton. And um, you know, Rocky and Ken they. Ken was responsible for going and getting all the, you know, Ray Malaluga, Brian Cushion, Keith Rivers, Kaluka Maiava, all these first and second round, you know, picks, Clay Matthews, all these guys. Yeah. He yeah. was responsible for teaching us the game, you know, and because, you know, Nort, I mean, four or five time Pro Bowl, three time straight, three straight Super Bowl championships. So, you know, And I think what he was able to impart on us was, was how to be a leader, how to be a professional and how to be a leader. You know, Nort, one of the greatest leaders I ever seen. He's, I mean, the guy lives for tough situations. The harder it gets, the more he loves it. And then the more relaxed he is. That's just, that's who he is. He's a true champion and um, on and off the field. And we all look to him as, as like a father figure, you know, he means that much to us. Uh, you know, just, 
the talks off the field and then, um, you know, and everything that he's taught us on the field, because he played all three positions. He played Sam, Mike, and Will, so middle and outside linebacker. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then Pete, you know, Pete bringing his philosophy of competition and the spirit of competition to SC is really what changed the culture. You know, he, he changed the culture around um, not just at SC, but also here in Seattle and, um, and brought in some, some talented players at both, you know, and so I saw, I was part of the, the building of an era at, at SC with Pete and Nort. And then I was exiting the game when I saw them start to bring in Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor, Richard Sherman, like, you know, Bobby Wagner, KJ Wright. I, so it was, it was crazy, you know, to be part of both life cycles, if you will, of the beginning of an era I, I, I bought, I built with them. And then I watched them take one over as I was leaving and, um, and make it, make it special and make it what we did at SC. I think you are the only player in, in, in franchise history who, who played with or under two of the three greatest coaches in Seahawks history. You played for Pete Carroll at SC and then you played for Holmgren. Um, yeah. When you compare the coaching styles, um, I guess you you uh, you mentioned um, uh, Holmgren as a as a giant teddy bear, <laughs> and Pete Carroll as a as a cool uncle with a swag. So it, it, that's entirely they're they're at the other ends of the spectrum. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Like like yeah, Holmgren's like like your dad, you know, and you know you just you know he'll he'll, he'll show he's a disciplinarian with that, you know, he just, he expects perfection. And, you know, not that, and you're never going to be perfect, but if you shoot, if you aim for perfection, you're going to, you're going to land somewhere around, you know, elite or great. And, you know, that's really what he, he thrived for. And that's what he, he, he emphasized the discipline part, you know, like no penalties. Don't, you know, don't, the NFL game's hard to win anyways. You know, it's hard to beat the other team. Don't beat yourself. Mm -hmm. And and Pete, you know, really energetic, really, you know, like let's go, like bring bring the bring the energy and um let's you know let's go compete. Um, you know, his his style was much more um I'd say, you know, I don't I don't want to say rah rah because that's what everybody says. They say rah rah. It's 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 not he's not a cheerleader. He is a player's coach. He'll rally and support you. And um and I think just the way they go about their their um their philosophies and their style is staying true to the who they are, you know, and and that's why they're both successful. But it's um because you know it's it's not it's not like one's fear and one's love, you know, the how yeah, it's yeah, yeah. But it's it's really discipline and energy was really how I would describe the two different philosophies. Like you know, they both expect you to bring it, but you know, one is very regimented, and the other one, Pete, is very energetic. Let's go, and um, and so they both work. I mm -hmm. mean, they both won Super Bowls. Mike's taken two different teams to the Super Bowl. Um, Pete's taken two teams, both Seahawks to the Super Bowl. So, I mean, it, their styles work, but it's, it's very different in, in terms of um, how they deliver their message. I think both are commanding uh, uh, or, or demanding commitment, right? Oh, so, oh they, coaching yeah. style is different, but See, in the end, you have well, to- that's what A lot of people don't understand. They think, oh, well, Pete's a player's coach and he's, I mean, he'll get after you, but he, he doesn't always have to, you know, with, that's not really what he, he doesn't want to do it, but he'll tell you when you're messing up and, you know, and, and big Mike, my, you know, Michael, Michael definitely, he'll tell you when you're messing up. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you love, you love that about Mike because he keeps it real. And as a player, you just, you want the truth. Like, you know, you can't, don't, don't lie to us. And that's what you get the truth, the honest truth out of, uh, out of Mike. And then, and then Pete, he'll help you get to the truth but i mean he he doesn't have to um he i don't i don't know i've i've heard pete yell before because that's what everybody's like oh i don't think he's ever really like yelled at a player pete, 
uh, he's yelled at me plenty of times and you know, <laughs> and yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so, uh, but because I always hated when they, they paint him as like a rah, rah cheerleader coach. I was like, no, nah, Pete, Pete demands per, for perfection too. Like that's what we're aiming for. And I think that's what the best coaches, you know, they expect, they expect your best. And that's, they both just want the best version of you and, and, you know, you to be yourself, but the best version of yourself. I think this 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 uh, players coaches stigma um, is a is a cliche. You know, you have you have coaches that are uh, um, interacting more with players. The other ones don't. But if you don't get success uh, or or access to the player to get success, it it doesn't matter at all. So yeah, I mean that's and I think that's you know it's it's a you know coaching's hard, man, um, and it really. I feel like there's a lot of guys that are great candidates to be head coach, but you only, it, he, the opportunities are few and far between because, you know, Pete, he coached with, I think the Jets and then New England, and then he was out and that, you know, and he went down to college and he got back to his philosophy of competition. He really, he, he got that, uh, that message clear about who he is and how he's teaching and, and what the message is competition. And then, A lot of people said, oh, it's not going to work in the NFL, but it will work in the NFL and he's proven it. But the thing is, it's hard to put a staff together. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what a lot of people don't understand. Like when someone gets into the job head coaching for the first time, how hard it is to just have the right staff and the right guys in place underneath you, because a lot of those guys are first time coordinators, first time position coaches. So that is in itself hard and then you know you gotta make sure that they all understand your philosophy and your terminology how you talk about uh the playbook how you talk about executing so um i have a lot of respect you know i always did for my coaches but then when i became part of pete's staff that was you know eye-opening to see you know just the grind of coaching wasn't wasn't it chris richard as the dc yeah in, at yeah during your time as an assistant he was no so me and chris it was crazy we we missed each other he got drafted by the hawks the year yeah. i came into sc but he left I, 2004 right yeah uh, no 2002 he got drafted second round of the hawks and but I he left in, the hawks in 2004 and you got drafted yes when you so left. no in 05 i got drafted yeah. we had a we had an off season together and oh, okay. we had we had mini camps and all that and then I think he got traded to either Miami or, or San Fran. And, but I mean, I, the knowledge that Chris had as a player was incredible. And I mean, that's why on top of his talent, um, which is why he got drafted in the second round. I mean, Chris, Chris was a great ball player. And I mean, but as a coach, man, I knew, I knew he was going to be great. Um, that's, that's one of the best coaches I ever been around. Okay. So back to your, playing days at SC. You had a great career at USC. You won two national titles. As I mentioned, you, I think, 25 starts over 200 tackles, right? And many sacks, many INTs for, for an inside linebacker. So um, you got drafted in the second round by the Seahawks, I guess, 45, um, 2005. So um, people were criticized in Seattle for picking you that high. What was, wasn't this a chip on your shoulder? I mean, I can't imagine because uh, this, this Tatupo guy is, is he's, he's too, too small, not big enough. He's too not small, fast enough. Too yeah. slow. Yeah. 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 But you I showed him. It. You showed him. I heard it my whole life. Yeah. You know, when I, when I left high school, I didn't really get recruited heavily. That's why I went to university of Maine and then I transferred to SC. And then when I got there, I was buried on the depth chart. I was like third or fourth string. And then I worked my way up, you know, really quickly because I learned the playbook and I put in the work and I was making plays and I started. And then I left there early, you know, I had one more year to play and everybody, again, they were telling me, you're not going to get drafted. You're not that good. And, you know, I'm just, I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, uh, I led the team in tackles both years. I was up there in sacks, interceptions. I'm not that bad. <laughs> That's what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. You know? And and I knew I was going to get drafted. I I was thinking anywhere from the second to the fourth round. 
And all the experts, they were like, ah, he's like a fifth, sixth round pick. <laughs> and so I was like, whatever. So then when I got drafted, like you said, a ton of, a ton of people were given, given the Seahawks heat. They were like, I can't believe we, they traded up for, they traded two fourth rounders to move up in the second round and, or yeah, second and a fourth to move up to pick an undersized linebacker from USC. And I mean, I didn't need any more motivation, you know, other, yeah. besides not getting recruited in high school, you know, everything else. Um, but, you know, that, that definitely, it, it, I, I remember hearing that. And um, I remember there was only one guy. I think he still works for ESPN. His name's Rob Rang. And, okay. and he, he wrote that he loved the pick. He said he couldn't believe that I lasted that long. He said, I thought I, I was going to go in the early second round uh, to, to like the box or something. And he said, in a year from now, I guarantee you that stadium is going to be flooded with Tatupu jerseys. And, <laughs> and so, and, yeah. um, and so Rob Rang, wherever you are, I appreciate you. Um, I got to tell him thank you because I remember I did an interview like a year ago with him and I was like, okay. Hey, I remember, I remember hearing a lot of criticism, but I only saw one positive article and it was from you. And so, um, but yeah, so, you know, I, it, it got to me, it got, it, it pissed me off. And so I, I yeah, went but, into but, this. Uh, I guess that's not a bad thing, right? So when, when I, when I remember the, the, the Super Bowl season in, in uh, 214, I think this was the mantra in Seattle. So every Doug Baldwin, for example, everyone, Lou Richard German. Yeah, the, we, we have this chip on our shoulders and everyone is underestimating us. And um, so now we're going to show them. Yeah. And, and all the media didn't underestimate him at the end of the year, of course, but they always riding this train and yeah, yeah. there come the Broncos offense and, and the record setting offense, but we're going to show them and they did. So, so did you. So um, I think it's not, not too bad to have a, a chip. On, on, on your shoulder, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, I never, I never really wanted to try to prove anybody else wrong. I always wanted to prove myself right. You know, I wanted to prove to myself like, hey, you know, we got this, like you can do this. And yeah. um, so I think that was more special to me. And, um, and I think, I think everybody was a little surprised when we went to the Super Bowl and, and I ended up in the Pro Bowl. <laughs> After that first year, yeah, as, so. as a rookie, right? Yeah, um, yeah. you were a signal caller, right, and from the get-go uh, in this defense. Yeah. How hard was it? Is was it to to come from college, get to the NFL, be a signal caller? Uh, yeah, in the end, you 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 made the Pro Bowl, but how hard was this for you to, to be a full snap, full down, every down player in this defense? And call the signals as well, signals as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I expect I put that pressure on myself. I, you know, I expected to start. I knew I had to earn my way and, and you know win the job. But um, you know, the, the playbook, I I'm really good at relating playbooks, you know, like and like it just makes sense in my head. So <laughs> when everybody it, it does, it's yeah. for some reason I could just I could take our old playbook from SC and I could see the similarities, even though the terminology. So it was in like a different language and that took some getting used to for all of us, everybody that's new. I don't care if you're an NFL veteran, when you go to a new team, they, they run some schemes similar, but they change the names. So, you know, just getting that terminology was, was, was a little, you know, tricky for most, but you know, once you get that down with hard work and studying, um, I was fully, confident in my ability to, to, to play the game, you know, early as, as a rookie, I wasn't, you know, I think a couple things set me up for early success, the coaching that I had at SC, right. So knowing, knowing it, we ran an NFL style defense down there. Yeah. So I, I knew, you know, I knew a lot more than, than most uh, rookies. Um, you know, my dad playing in the NFL, I knew what was expected and kind of, I had been to a locker room before an NFL locker room. And I, I knew it just felt like home to me. And so, um, and then I'm not, you know, you got it. Let's be serious. We had a number one offense and that, 
that makes your job a little easier on defense. You know, yeah. when you're playing with leads, you know, you get to sit back and catch interceptions, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so um, you know, there was, there was several things that set me up for early success, but, um, but just, I think the, the, the main thing was that I, you know, I wanted it more than most people did, you know, I really did. Okay. You talked about the offense in that year, uh, 05. Um, your whole career with the Seahawks, you played with, with Matt Hasselbeck as your quarterback. So um, I guess the fami familiarity or the, 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 the common history with both of you is that your dads, you both of your dads played together at uh, New England. Um, yeah. So did you met New before? Um, yeah. did, you, did you meet him before? before yeah, you I knew Matt for Seattle? When we were I knew Matt when we were kids. Um, <laughs> okay. So he he's I think five or six years older than me. Um, yeah. But I, I competed against his youngest brother. So it was Matt, then there's Tim, and then there's Nathaniel, his youngest, and they were all phenomenal athletes. And um, me and Nathaniel used to play against each other, uh, you know, a lot. But yeah, I, I knew well about you know uh, the Hasselbacks. They were great athletes, and uh, they they grew up a town over from us. And um, yeah, man, it was awesome. It was good to see another a familiar face, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, are you yeah. still in touch today? Yeah, I still we still keep in touch, text message and whatnot. Um, I see him. I see him every Sunday on on NFL Countdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. fun to watch. Yeah, um, I saw a tweet uh, from you. I don't know from when, but <laughs> it was a, a Hasselbeck video when he's talking about the David Hasselhoff thing. The Night Rider guy. <laughs> how how many times did you call him the Night Rider? I, I called him Hasselhoff his whole career. <laughs> I think we even we even got him a shirt one time. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know whether you know this, but David Hasselhoff is a big thing in Germany or was a he's big a thing in Germany. Yeah, I guess he's treasure out there, right? Yeah. He's far <laughs> more popular in, in Germany than in than he ever was in the United States. As well with the Knight Rider thing and the Baywatch thing, and then he was yeah. a singer as well. And he broke down the Berlin Wall uh, by himself. So I guess that's the way he sees it, but you know, <laughs> he's, he's pretty popular in Germany. I think this is a good story. So Hasselbeck is Hasselhoff, right? Hasselhoff, yeah. yeah. Um, let's stay in the 05 season, um, the playoff run, but because um, you, you you broke many streaks, you you played against the Redskins in the in the in the first round. Um, mm -hmm. You you broke the the winless playoff streak um, for the Seahawks in that year. You had the NFC Championship game against Carolina. How was mm -hmm. this game for you? Was it was it the biggest win in your career? I remember as a fan, um, even Carrie Underwood made the thing, the, the national anthem. That's how this game started, and then it was Jake Delorme having the worst day in his whole career because of your defense. I suppose you had an interception against Delorme. Um, I think they lost their, their starting running back pretty early in that game. Yeah, um, me and him, yeah. we, me and him collided. And yeah, 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 I remember. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but he was down and you were not, so everything was fine. Yeah. And uh, you shut down Steve Smith. And um, I guess this was a perfect game. Do you see it this way as well? It was, yeah, it was an awesome game plan. Um, you know, everything special teams, offense, defense, everybody was, we were firing all cylinders and it was the atmosphere, like the man, the energy in the air was electric. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, I, that has to be the biggest that, or, you know, I won the national championship in college, but this is the NFL and this is the conference championship for, to play for the right to go to the Super Bowl, And we had it at home and um, it was incredible, man. Um, and I mean, That, that whole year, because, I mean, we had like a 10 or 11 game winning streak until, until the final game. We lost to the, to the Packers because I, I think Homer pulled everybody because he thought Brett Favre was going to finally retire. And little did we know that Favre would play five more years. Yeah. <laughs> But um, so, it, you know, that playoff run was incredible because we did. We got to, you know, play the Redskins and beat them again or beat them because they beat us earlier in the season. Mm -hmm. I think that was our – Our second loss before you know we went on that uh, that 10 game you know tear, but um, man, when I think back at that that Carolina game, that 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 collision was pretty uh, intense. You know, I was, yeah, I, I remember. <laughs> I was I was out on my feet, 
And uh, unfortunately for, for the running back, he was out of the game. But um, at that point, then they had, they really didn't, they were down to their third or fourth string tailback. So they, yeah. they had to throw the ball and uh, we got a couple of three or four interceptions. And um, it was, uh, man, it was just, that whole season was magical, but that game was, was really special. Mm. Um, now let's, let's uh, cut it short with the Super Bowl, I guess, <laughs> playing the Steelers. <laughs> Um, did you still, or did you ever have had the feeling, or have the feeling that you've been robbed, or that the NFL just wanted to get Bill Cowher and Jerome Bettis that ring? Because that's what I felt until now. I'm feeling it. Yeah, it's, it seems like a lot of people felt that way, and you know, I didn't. I, I knew there were a lot of you know really tough calls. I didn't feel that way until four years later the officials came out at our practice and they apologized to us. Was Bill and, Levy at the practice, right? Yeah. And, and I just, from th that, that got me upset. That got me hot. I was, <laughs> okay. because I was like, I was like, yo man, like, just, just leave it. Like, we don't need an explanation. You called it how you called it. Like, let it, but I guess the only, the only thing that was good about that, that moment was that, you know, you could really finally have peace with, with what happened, you know, because now, you know, me and my boys, my teammates, we knew that the moment wasn't too big for us. And, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing because you go, you, you go through your head, you keep playing it back. Like, Oh, could I have done this? Could I have done that? Like, was the moment too big for us? And, and him telling us that meant no, that there were some terrible calls that did cost, change the outcome of the game. Now, it would have been easier to, to, to take if we got blown out, right? Mm -hmm. if, we, if we lost by like 30, you know, then you're not complaining about three or four calls that went the other way. You know, you're just like, ah, well, we still lost by like three touchdowns, four touchdowns. But so that, that was tough to take. But like I said, the, you make peace with it knowing that it was something out of your control. You couldn't control it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... How, you you mentioned the the, the 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 chemistry kind of in this team in the uh, during the 05 season. Um, oh. Who were the defensive leaders? Because you were a rookie, you were a signal caller, but um, everyone talks about the offense in this year. It was Hasselbeck, it was Sean Alexander as MVP, the one and only in Seahawks history. Um, Max Strong, I guess, had to be a veteran leader, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you had guys like Walter Jones, Hutch. Robbie Toback in the O line. So this left side was absolute. I think yeah. there was never, has never been a better left side in NFL history uh, in, in the O line. But uh, who were the leaders on defense? Was it Marcus Trufant, Bryce, we, Bryce Fisher, Michael well, we Bowler? I don't know. You named all the guys on offense. I mean, the, there was leaders, both offense, defense, special teams. We had a bunch of leaders out there too. Um, but when you talk about defense, um, I was Grant Wistrom was one of our voted captains at the beginning of the season. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and he won a Super Bowl at the Rams. He, you know, he very similar, you know, in terms of career. I mean, he won two, I think two or three national titles at Nebraska. And, and so that was a guy that we voted before the season as our captain on defense, because you have an offense, a defense, and yeah. a special teams. And then when they voted again for postseason, that I got voted the defensive captain for the postseason, which was the greatest honor of my career, um, was being voted captain. Played six years, and I was voted captain six times, and that I'll cherish that forever. But um, we had captains in the secondary, and with Ken Hamlin, and and then when when he got hurt, Kenny got hurt. Um, in came Marquand Manuel, and mm -hmm. and he did a great job of of really you know taking control of the back and, and, you know, doing what, what Ken was normally doing, you know, being the, the, the signal caller back there, because as the middle linebacker, I counted on a lot of people to, you know, help relay the message. And so, you know, Ken Hammond and Mark Wom were back there and, um, you know, True and Dyson and Herndon, they're out on the, they're pretty much on the, on the, uh, the Island by themselves. We're just giving them signals like, Hey, cover two, cover three. Yeah. Uh, And then D.D. Lewis was a guy that I looked to, um, you know, he as because, you know, I, I was a, a rookie 
and you know, he's still looking up to these guys. And Didi, he always brought he always brought the hammer, man. He brought the funk, and so um, we were always trying to out hit each other, me, him, and Leroy. <laughs> okay. And uh, and then up front, like I said, you know, Rocky Bernard, he was a leader, just getting it done. Um, Bryce Fisher, Grant, we we had leaders at every position. And the defense, it really because you have the number one offense, you, we really didn't get much credit, but we didn't care. We just wanted to win. Like we, yeah. 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 That the chemistry throughout that whole team, that was one of the closest teams at any level: high school, pop Warner, college, NFL. That was one of the closest teams I ever played on. I mean, mm-hmm. just everybody pulling in the same direction, you know. And that's why you. That's how you make it to the Super Bowl because it's it's not it's not easy making it that far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a absolutely great season with a bitter ending. So how, how can you can't change it, but you can always appreciate the season, I guess, um, because yeah, it, more, from that know, point, it was it was yeah. another decade until Seattle made it to the Super Bowl. So it's right. not it's not that that easy, I guess. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, we we thought we, you know, we thought we would get back, you know, um, but free agency happens. Things happen. And it's it's it's, it's tough. And, uh, and we got close. We got the divisional, I think, both times. Uh, Robbie Gould kicked a 55-yarder into the wind to, in overtime to, like, beat us. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Because you know, I think if we beat them, then we face New Orleans. And we weren't we weren't afraid of New Orleans. Not that we're afraid of anybody. I'm just saying we would have went down there, no problem, if we just beat the Bears. Because the Bears went to the Super Bowl. The Bears, uh, they were the team wasn't, to Wasn't it the, the Rex Grossman saga? Yeah. 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 The Bears, they beat or they they lost to um, Indy and Peyton Manning, yeah. but they were they were they were the tough the team to beat, you know, over there. So yeah. um and then and then the next year we we win the first round, we go to Green Bay, 14 nothing, and then the snow comes in. Yeah, I know. Oh man. So it's just it's crazy, you know, it's 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 how close you get and And then how the window, the window kind of closes because guys get older, you know, the, our core guys were, when I was a rookie, the core guys like Walt and all those guys, Hutch, um, they were really in their prime, right? They were five, six years in, Hass was maybe seven, seven years in, somewhat six or seven years in. Then those are, it's like, man, you got a window of three or four years where you can keep the majority of these guys, they're, they're young enough, and then you know healthy enough and then but you got then contract issues right because yeah the sal- salary cap destroyed we, or for good we had to lose, destroyed we, everything. we lost hutch yeah yeah, we yeah. Lost hutch, which i mean a hall of fame guard you know the difference that makes you know <laughs> for yeah. for a team so but yeah but you you personally personally as a player what was your best season When you look at it now, was it the rookie season because it was so hard as a new player coming to the NFL and, and and do all these things, calling the signals and so on in a new environment, or was it 2007 when you were uh, uh, an all pro and when you had your <laughs> three pick game against the Eagles, of course? What was um, your best best season personally? I don't know which one was my best. I mean, they they were all. They were, I mean, numbers wise, my first three were all pretty similar. Um, but my, the one I just loved the most was that first season because, you know, I think like you mentioned, no one expected a undersized, slow <laughs> middle linebacker to come in. They didn't even think, they thought it was a waste of a pick. And so for me to go out there and perform the way I did, but more importantly for us to get as far as we did in the playoffs, Ending the ending the playoff drought, uh, win drought, getting to the bringing the first conference championship, um, you know, just getting to hang two banners up there for a division title and conference title. I mean, it didn't get any better than that. Okay, so uh, what was your um, which, which takes me to my favorite play in your career? It was I wrote it on Instagram. It was the tackle against Witten in the, I guess, two, six wildcard game. So everyone's yeah. talking about the, 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 the Romo fumble 
um, during the free gold trial, everyone. So, but I was sitting during a, a skiing vacation in Austria in the middle of the night, you know, I was uh, watching, watching the game and I saw the third down Romo short pass to Witten. Witten turns and then there comes the undersized middle linebacker um, <laughs> and moves him backwards. If he had just a few inches more, it was, it would have been first down and the Cowboys win the game because they, they, they are going to, to milk the clock. Uh, game. Yeah. So yeah. please tell me, how, uh, which, which, uh, which rank does this play get in your personal highlights? You know, that, it was a good one. It was brutal. I, it was so, I, it was. I was last year, just <laughs> the drive before, there was a, Kelly John Jennings forced a fumble. Yeah. And I, I saved the ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. I threw it back and we, we thought we were going to get a touchdown, but my toe was out and it was better for us because we got a safety and then Matt hit Jeremy Stevens for a touchdown, mm -hmm. which gave us the lead. So mm -hmm. I thought that play was actually bigger, but you know, um, I remember on that play, I was, I, I knew the play. I was like, okay, they're going to run the, it was, they run a, a corner route and then they sit the tight end. It's like a rub route. And I was like, I'm going to get an interception. And the guy running the corner route, the, the, the backup tight end, I don't know if, I think it was Pisano. He did a great job of running slow to make sure I couldn't get across. Mm -hmm. And so now I just knew, okay, well, I have to go over the top, like with this, I can't just cut across. And that put me in position to go head to head with Witten. And um, I just, I got under him just enough and, and, you know, it you know, took a couple steps and then, um, you know, and then the rest is history. It was, uh, it, it was, it was fun. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where it ranks in terms of uh, all time plays for me. To me, it ranks first forever. So just, just okay. be short. It will always be one of my, my favorite Seahawks plays of all time. And, and, and you're well, a lot on the Lofa Tatupo highlight list. It ranks first. Well, the craziest part was initially they gave him the first down. Yeah. And, yeah. and I remember I was like, wait, when I, when I hit him, I knew where I was when I hit him. And I was like, he didn't, he went backwards. And that's what I was trying to tell the ref. And luckily Holmgren threw the flag because, you know, I thought Dallas was going to line up quick. Homer through the flag, but um, I just, that's the only thing I did remember was talking to the ref, like, and you know, the ref's probably like, get out of here, rookie. Or, you know, or second, that was my second year. Get out of here, get out of here young guy. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, yeah, that was a wild game, man. So, so your, your hate was an advantage in this case because it came low. So. Built, should... built in leverage, man. <laughs> Low man wins. I got underneath yeah, him, and yeah, yeah, you know he's a Hall of Famer. But I won. I won that battle. You won it for sure. Um, so, thanks for the for the history. Um, now let's uh, let's get back in the end to to the current NFL. Um, which type of linebacker is your most favorite uh, guy right now? Is it is, is it a guy like Devin White who played an absolute monster playoffs um, with the with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers um, or is it is it still Bobby Wagner or KJ Wright I still you got credit always goes to the elder the respect goes to the elders okay and Bobby okay and KJ, Bobby and KJ have been doing this for 10 years now and so Devin White I mean he he turned a lot of heads with the season he had 140 tackles nine sacks I mean, as an inside always, inside linebacker, nine sacks. I mean, it's it's absolutely incredible. I don't like I said. I don't know. Leroy Hill had seven and a half one year, our rookie year, but like that's as a stand up behind the ball linebacker. That's incredible. Um, but yeah, he is. That's that's the prototype, and he's built much similar. He's built similar to Bobby, just two hundred and forty five pounds, four four forties. Both of them are fast and. Um, you know, it's, um, they're, they're a lot of fun to watch, but I still got to go with my guys, Bobby and KJ. Those are my most fun to watch. Then I'll go Devin White, um, Leonard, Darius Leonard from uh, Indy. He's, you know, I like guys. Yeah, he, can, that just, he can do it all, right? I like guys that can do it all. And I like guys that just wreak havoc. They just, they show up in a bad mood. Uh, Jordan Brooks is one of those guys. Mm -hmm. 
the rookie. I mean, he he's got an attitude and edge about him, and so I like guys that play with that that energy, that that swagger. Is is Brooks a successor for KJ Wright in your mind, in your opinion? I I don't think so. I you know he looked his game looked a lot to me like uh, Kendricks. You know, um, Eric, Ken um, was it Michael Kendricks. That, Michael, that we yeah. Just had? yeah, we just had Michael Kendricks and they're both, you know, um, fast, strong and downhill. They shoot gaps. They, they make a lot of tackles for loss. So I thought, I thought it was going to be a replacement for Mike. Uh, and then they moved KJ to Sam and played, you know, Brooks at will. And so we'll see what happens. KJ is a, he's a free agent now, so we'll see what happens, but um, yeah, I mean, it'd be great if we could keep all three of those guys. Do you think Seattle gets a hometown discount from KJ Wright? I don't know. I think he what kind you of what you do it. I think he took a discount on the last deal, and you know, um, for you know, for what linebackers are getting paid out there, and I don't know. I it's 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 almost it's kind of I feel like it's disrespectful to to ask you know someone that's not really ever been given fair market value to take a discount again when he just put up the two best seasons of his career mm -hmm. uh, career high in tackles and interceptions two years ago and then this past year they asked him to move his position to sam he doesn't complain because he's the ultimate team guy he goes over there only guy in the nfl with more than 10 pass deflection 10 tackles for loss and uh a couple other there's a couple other things and only guy Only one guy did that this year, and that's him moving to a new position. So yeah. his value, his value on top of that as a leader, cannot be understated. Man, they, you know, they people don't understand how much he does, um, you know, for this organization and this community. So I, I gotta, I gotta understand. I gotta side with him, and I'm a fan now, you know, and I want, I want it to work. But you know, it's, it's like it's still a business at, at the end of the day, and you know, asking someone to take less than what they're worth is, is it's tough, man. I can see, I can see if he was making, you know, 20 or whatever, or, you know, like, but he's not, you know, I think he needs to get paid what, what he's worth. Yeah. Um, so we are talking about the current team. Um, and I can't leave you without asking you the question. What's your standpoint on the Russell Wilson, Pete Carroll thing? Um, I guess a few weeks back there was this one interview where 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 russell said yeah um i got hit too much but be, before in the first place he said I, i want to get the rid uh, i want to get rid of the ball quickly yes. so he, and they did this editing and all that stand was this one statement but yes. now even when they when there were teams um, um in the discussion where he could get traded eventually and so on. Do you see it still as a, as a big nonsense? I don't, I didn't give much thought to it because just like you said, they edited that, that first clip, like they cut out him saying, I got to get rid of the ball. And then he said, yeah, I'd like to not get hit as much. But then when four teams came out like, and said, Hey, if, if I was to be traded, this is where I'd like to go. That was kind of concerning. So, I mean, you know, I, I would love Russ to just, you know, put it on camera and say, hey, man, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm a Seahawk, you know, for now at least, you know, for life, I hope. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. It, it is crazy because he hasn't asked for a trade, but then four teams as potential landing spots came up. And that, that kind of makes me uneasy as a fan, you know, <laughs> kind yeah. of makes me I don't want to lose Russ. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's uh, it's just his his agent's idea. Um, that's where I'm leaning now because they they say okay we're gonna put put some heat on Pete. So you know if the next season uh, crumbles down and we don't have success, everyone will say yeah because you don't uh, you didn't give uh, Russell what he wanted before the season started. So I think it's a bit a little bit of tactics as well. But who knows? Yeah. No one knows. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Man. Yeah. So thank that. you, Lofa. My, my absolutely last question for you would be, um, you've been inducted into the Polynesian Hall of Fame, like your dad. Um, where does this success stand for you? What does it mean to you? Um, I'd be lying if I said it didn't mean a lot to me. And, you know, mostly 
because because of my dad, you know, um, to, to join him, you know, and, you know, for our heritage and just, you know, be be in there with him. It means a lot to me because, you know, I lost him 11 years ago. Um, last month was the, the anniversary. And so um, everything I've ever done was to follow in his footsteps, you know, as as a as an athlete, as a player, um, now as a dad and then also off the field as a man. Um, you know, he left some big shoes to fill, you know, and but in, in every every walk of life. So um, I'm honored to to be there with him. Thank you. Thank you, Lofa. Um, I'm humbled. I'm re I, I really am because uh, you were an absolute um, favorite of mine as a player and uh, you are such a great person. So thank you very much for your time and um i get back to you i sent you all the you know um, the, the cover and the, the thing with oh, the man, i can't wait to see it yeah i appreciate you thank you for doing this yeah of course no problem so thank you and um i hear you i see you all right, all right. Good luck. Bye.